Hello to everyone. Um, for those that are already here, we are just going to leave it a couple of minutes before starting. Um, so do grab yourself a, a drink if you haven't got one and uh, we will commence in, in a couple of minutes. Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, hopefully you uh, are all seeing a poll on your screen. It would be great to have a sense of, of where you are from and what sort of organisations you are affiliated to. So without further ado, welcome very much to this session on social enterprise and related businesses from the Investment Climate Reform Facility, which I'll go on to talk a little bit more about uh, in a while. We have a range of people from around the world that have registered to attend this. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's a real delight to, to be hosting this um, and to welcome people from so far afield and from such a range of geographies. My name is Owen Dowsett. I'm a senior consultant with the British Council within its global social enterprise team. And the British Council is a partner within the Investment Climate Reform Facility before going into a little bit more detail and some introductions, I just would like to uh, cover a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, one is to say that this session is being recorded. It will be available for download and for viewing upon completion of the session um, and can be passed on to people that weren't able to attend as well. Um, so please do keep that in mind. Uh, you should hopefully, many of you might not be familiar with this uh, platform that we're using, but hopefully within the panel on your screen, you should be able to see a function for uh, asking questions. Um, so please do try and familiarise yourself with that. And as we go through the presentation and the session, please do take a note of any comments or queries that you would like to raise. And there'll be a couple of opportunities within the session to, to raise them and for, for us to respond and to discuss. Um, I guess just to run quickly through what the the uh, schedule is going to be uh, for the next um, couple of hours, um, we're going to start with uh, an introduction to the ICR facility, the Investment Climate Reform Facility, and we'll be hearing from a couple of people who are involved in the key um, partners of that uh, facility, um, who I will introduce shortly. It'll be great to hear from them. I will then be um, running through uh, some background to the ICR facility, what it sets out to do and how you can get involved and what its objectives are and so on. Uh, and then I will revisit the aims and objectives uh, for this session, including some of the background that is kind of driven the need for this session. And we will then hear from a couple of people from the social investment consultancy who are doing some work uh, around the themes of today. Uh, and we'll present some emergent findings, which they will be feeding into a policy paper for the Investment Climate Reform Facility. Um, and it will be great to have some of the input from today uh, that they can include and incorporate into that policy paper. So do, as I said, make a note of any comments or suggestions you have. Uh, we will then introduce our panel of speakers. We have a panel of four today, and they're from some really great organisations that are working <clears throat> excuse me, working in different ways on the ground with social enterprises and inclusive businesses and, and B Corps and uh, small and growing businesses and all sorts of 
uh, local enterprises. Um, and it will be great for you to put some questions to them as well. And we will finish off with some conclusions um, and next steps. And we'll highlight again how you can get involved um, and follow on the conversation, including accessing some one-to-one -one support through some virtual clinics. Um, so without further ado, I would like first and foremost, um, I'm not sure that we have both of the expected people here, but I'd like first and foremost to introduce uh, Miguel Campo Lopez, um, who is uh, a policy officer, um, the Director General uh, with Development Corporation of the EU. Um, so, and I know he'd like to say some uh, welcoming words. So please, Miguel. Yes, thank you, Owen. Thank you very much. And can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Great. So, uh, good afternoon to everyone, or good morning, depending on, on where you are, and, and welcome to to this webinar. Uh, my name is Miguel Campo, and like I was saying, I work for the European Commission uh, uh, within the Development Cooperation Director General, and uh, we are uh, uh, together with the British Council, uh, the Foreign Ministry of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Germany, and uh, and OACPS, uh, supporting financially and, and, and conceptually this this facility. And basically, what I wanted to share with you is some, some thoughts about uh, access to finance and, in particular, uh, innovative financing for, for social enterprises and inclusive business. As we all know, uh, this is at the center of, of, of the agenda and it's a key element towards achieving the uh, SDGs. Uh, from the European Commission, we're working strongly on, on supporting access to finance from both per, two perspectives, basically, on the one hand, through financial instruments like guarantees and blended finance, but also working on the investment climate. And this is common to basically, uh, it's a challenge, working on these two things is a challenge basically for all kinds of, of support to private sector, but it's especially relevant when it comes to social enterprises and inclusive business. Uh, but in this particular case, we have additional challenges, which is what it is that we understand by inclusive business and social enterprises. And, and this is part of the discussion, I think, that we will have today and, and in the following webinars, because this is a key part of promoting sustainable development, but also it's a challenging uh, segment of, 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 the, of the economy. Uh, we all know that uh, by only provide, providing financial instruments, uh, we're not uh, uh, making uh, happen the, the, trans the transformation. We also know that working on the investment climate and, and changing the policy and regulatory reform, it's needed, but it's not enough. So we also have to be creative and, and define new ways of, 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 of uh, confronting these challenges. And, and that's what we were doing in the Commission through, through the European External Investment Plan, together with our partners of the OACPS, promoting different instruments for different segments of the economy, looking at women economic empowerment, looking at youth, and, and also looking at social enterprises and, and inclusive business and, and trying to, to discuss with our partners how to best uh, achieve this. Um, among the different instruments that we have, we have the ICR facility because we're taking basically opportunity of the knowledge uh, of many of our uh, member states agencies together with the British Council who has extensive experience on this and, and can provide um, uh, important uh, uh, knowledge and support to both public and private sector actors from the ACP. So basically, um, this is one of many webinars. I'm sure you might have followed all the webinars that we are promoting through the ICE facility. And I strongly suggest that you follow up on what we're doing because we're trying to really, really support in a very practical and operational way, uh, uh, private sector and uh, governments to actually transform uh, their economies. And this is even more relevant within the pandemic we are embedded all, where, which is affecting all of us and we all have to bring our resources together and our knowledge and capacity to really ensure that we come out of this in a sustainable and positive way. Um, I won't take more time. I think I will leave you with the, with the panelists who are the really interesting people in this, in this session. And hopefully we'll have a productive and, and interesting discussion. And, and please follow up on, on the work we're doing with the ICA facility, with the implementers, who are today here and, and also with the other partners and I'm happy to to see that we have so many people and and following this and hope for the best and wish you all the luck today. Thank you so much Miguel and it's really great to hear from you and have your involvement today. Um, we will uh, probably hear from Christiana who's representing the OACPS um, a little bit later in the session but I think she's just having some difficulties connecting. 
Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about what Miguel was referring to there in terms of the investment climate reform facility, just to give you a bit of background, because I realise many of you won't be aware. Um, the facility is funded through the European Development Fund under the partnership agreement between African, Caribbean and Pacific organisation and uh, the EU, uh, together with funding from BMZ um, from Germany and from the British Council. And the intention of the facility is really to support the countries and regional institutions in Africa, Caribbean and Pacific countries in their public private dialogue processes to create a more conducive and sustainable investment climate. In terms of the practical support that's available, it's on a demand led um, basis. So requests can be submitted to the facility to receive up to 90 days of technical assistance. Uh, and this might be focused on business environment reform. It might be in relation to public private dialogue processes. Uh, it might be in, in, in relation to the sustainability of the business environment and social enterprise is an example of that. It's important to note that it's for 90 days of technical assistance. So it's not funding directly, um, but it would come in the form of technical assistance. And there's some um, criteria there in terms of what uh, requests need to to be. They need to be aimed at improving the business and investment climate in an ACP country, so specifically for African, Caribbean and Pacific countries. It needs to be linked to a wider strategy um, or reform process or private uh, and public sector dialogue mechanism. Um, and it needs to include that. And it needs to be uh, made by governmental organisations, business associations, development financial institutions and EU delegations in those countries. So there's a bit of eligibility criteria there. And uh, I will also um, later on in the session talk about the virtual clinics and one to one support that are available to kind of feed into this process on the back of what you might hear today. So so please do bear with us and, and stick around for that. Now, I'd like to really just talk about um, some of the reasoning for the for the work um, which you'll be hearing about today um, and to really get a sense of where this is coming from. And I'll only speak briefly about that, but it kind of feeds into the aims and objectives of today's session. Um, and really, it's something that I think all of the partners in the Investment Climate Reform Facility have a common interest in. And it's all to do with access to finance for those businesses on the ground that are working to deliver developmental priorities and, and address social challenges in ACP countries. And what we're really interested in is how to kind of nurture a more inclusive approach to the availability of finance uh, and investment for social enterprises in their various forms. And I think this is in recognition that traditionally and too easily um, investment and, and finance has followed a kind of one size fits all approach, which doesn't necessarily respond to and recognize the great variety of businesses that exist out there and that are working on the ground um, and really responds to their various needs in terms of finance and, and capital and support. So that's really the kind of basis about where this comes from. This is the first in a series of sessions which will focus on access to finance. Um, and we're starting with really staying true and representing the, the, the range of organisations that exist out there and might uh, support business environment reform and support uh, our, our journey towards meeting kind of some of the key social challenges around the world. So the aims and objectives today I would put into three brackets really. Uh, one is to highlight the many shapes and sizes of social enterprises and related business forms and types across ACP countries. The next is to explore how different factors influencing influence their financing needs and their access to finance. And thirdly, to consider the role of policymakers, other support organisations and influencers in better supporting and enabling the diversity of social enterprises. Now, as I said, there's going to be a policy paper produced, um, which will hopefully be of use to those key stakeholders. And it's being produced by the Social Investment Consultancy, um, which is working in collaboration and getting feedback and input from various um, key stakeholders and organisations. And they will be soon be talking. I just want to introduce them briefly. Um, firstly, Bonnie Chu, who is the managing director of the Social Investment Consultancy, and she led the firm's international expansion into Asia, Africa and the Middle East. She has a great track record and has been recognised in various ways and won various accolades. So it's great to have her on board once again. And uh, she's accompanied by Sarah Jane Danchi, 
um, who is the Associate Director for Africa at the Social Investment Consultancy. She's based in Ghana and she leads the consultancy's multi-country projects in various African countries, focusing on socioeconomic evaluations, impact measurement, social investment, gender and youth empowerment, um, and research to do with those, with those issues. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to, to Bonnie and Sarah Jane to provide a little more detail and context and findings about some of those themes that I've mentioned. So welcome, Bonnie, and thank you. And Sarah Jane. Thanks very much, Owen. Pleased to be here today. So um, as Owen said, this webinar has three different objectives and they very much similarly also reflect the purpose of the policy paper. So I'm just going to do a brief presentation with my colleague Sarah Jane on some of the emergent findings that will help frame the upcoming panel discussion as well as the policy paper. I think to start with, we really need to recognize that there are such varying needs of social enterprises and inclusive businesses across Africa, Caribbean and Pacific countries. While there is not a formal definition uh, for a social enterprise or inclusive business, there is a general understanding of what they do. Uh, one definition that I would like to highlight, um, which has come from the European Union, but is adopted uh, very much across the world, is that a social enterprise is an operator in the social economy whose main objective is to have a social impact rather than make a profit for their owners or shareholders. Uh, well, with that in mind, um, we, however, found that across ACP countries, social enterprises are often not defined in policy or legislation. Actually, only in South Africa is social enterprise explicitly recognized in its policies. We know that there are a few other countries such as Ghana that's coming up in terms of recognizing the role of social enterprises, but they, they usually don't have a recognized role within policies and uh, legislation. Um, which brings to the issue around how the challenge around having not having a coherent policy framework to turn to, which is why we've seen a proliferation of social enterprises uh, being used as an overarching term, but actually we mean very different things. And this web webinar is really trying to unpick what those different things are. And um, so we we found so far that it represents this term, social enterprise, inclusive businesses and other labels. Actually, all these represent a wide range of legal forms as well as business models. Uh, and we want to really distinguish between the two because we've found that um, in most literature, they're often conflated. Uh, but with legal forms um, of social enterprises, how popular some legal forms are really depend on the context, on the legislation that currently exists within the country. Um, this graph is a graph that we've taken from the INSEAD Business School. It's just a very simple spectrum looking at, on the left hand side, uh, organizations that deliberately focus on social impact to, on the right hand side, uh, organizations that are operating within market forces and with, without a deliberate focus on social impact. And social enterprises, inclusive businesses very much fall in the middle. Uh, but within that, we also see there is a split between nonprofit and for-profit entities. Um, the split between nonprofit and for-profit entities really depends on local legislation. What British Council study has found is that in uh, some countries, such as in Kenya and Ethiopia, only 15% of social enterprises are registered as not-for-profits. Um, but then in Jamaica, um, close to 41% are registered as such. So there is indeed quite a broad range. And of course, their legal form would then mean they have different needs around financing and that they have different criteria around being able to meet investors' needs as well. There are also certain labels that we want to highlight at this point, such as B Corp, small and growing businesses, social businesses. These are terms that you will hear float around, but hopefully this gives a good context setting slide to help us understand what those different things are and how we can start unpicking uh, the differences among all these different organizations. The next slide is taking deeper beyond the legal form and um, the uh, business models. Actually, there are other differences among social enterprises. The first one we want to highlight is how they scale. So um, 
what we found in our research is that overwhelmingly, a lot of enterprises actually choose not to scale. Uh, we, before talking about social enterprises specifically, we found a parallel movement in the entrepreneurship space uh, where um, unicorns are now being challenged by zebras. So zebras are a form of uh, company, um, uh, is a label for companies that choose not to scale and at all costs. And so we have found that within social enterprises, there are similar trends as well. There are organizations that are very locally rooted and they choose not to scale. Um, and even when they do scale, they scale very differently. The experience of uh, British Council in the UK was that a lot of social enterprises that internationalize, they don't just increase the headcount of the headquarter, but they actually scale um, in a horizontal manner, meaning that they allow partners to replicate their model and that they can contextualize what they're doing. So this horizontal scaling rather than vertical scaling. Uh, secondly, it also depends on how, who the entrepreneurs really are. Uh, we found that in um, African countries, of course, with a, a wide, with a, with a huge youth population, social enterprises are actually very popular among younger uh, people. Um, however, anecdotal evidence has shown that actually social entrepreneurs aged over 30 and with some industry experience are more likely to succeed and are preferable from an investor perspective. This is currently anecdotal evidence, uh, but we are hoping that with more discussions, we can find out what are the specific needs of entrepreneurs um, and therefore what are the specific needs of their social enterprises that investors need to bear in mind. Other differences include their level of maturity, uh, sectors, uh, as well as their target communities. And summarizing all the factors and impacting social enterprises' ability to operate, fundraise, and finally thrive, um, First of all, is the lack of policy framework and favorable legislation. If such enabling framework exists, it does support social enterprises' ability to operate. But some legislation might only favor for profit enterprises, not non profit social enterprises. So those things need to be taken into account. Uh, secondly, uh, within financing, financing options are also limited by legal forms and the asset base. You know, if organizations do not have a strong asset base, they might need to, um, of course, investors would perceive them as higher risk. Uh, we've found that there's generally a lack of risk and impact focused capital across ACP countries, and the loans available on the market are currently too large for what enterprises need. From Social Enterprises Ghana, and we'll hear later on from a representative, um, they found that 70% of their members actually require less than $50,000 in terms of financing. And, and finally, and, uh, some other challenges are around operational um, challenges. And again, if entrepreneurs, they have specific needs, that might mean that their operational challenges also differ. So I now pass it to my colleague, Sarah Jane, to talk a bit more about the barriers faced by enterprises in the social finance space. So if I just elaborate a bit more on the finance, financing challenges. We find that um, social enterprises need financing at different stages, often in the first stages of building the business. Social enterprises have to draw on their own and family resources. They also need money at different um, major points of expansion and scaling and getting through disruptive times like COVID. Um, if you look at the examples, we found that in um, Ethiopia, for example, um, there was a there's a huge challenge in, in the sense that almost 38% have not received any source of funding. Um, in Jamaica, um, social enterprises have to draw mainly from government um, sources, um, local foundations, international donor agencies, and individual donors. Then if we move on to the another set of challenges from Western investors, um, those that invest across ATP countries, we find that they may bring additional barriers to accessing finance. Some examples of this can be, um, have been uh, seen in East Africa, where you found that mostly expats from the West 
um, receive um, investment from um, receive investment from them. So Western investors tend to privilege certain types of entrepreneurs and those with ambitions to scale. But this is another challenge because not all social enterprises have or can, or it's not feasible for them to scale in the way that um, investors want. So this has been a huge problem in them ac um, accessing finance. Um, and finally, um, different concepts of credit worthiness um, and limited um, but largely non-existent businesses um, do not report um, their impact. We found that a study by Ind a study by in, uh, in Insight showed that um, a lot of social entrepreneurs um, do not uh, know how to measure the amount of impact, social impact that they're having. And this can be a challenge um, in terms of um, demonstrating their impact and um, getting finance from investors. So the next slide, please. So we, some of the emerging um, recommendations that have come out from the findings so far, we found a role, um, three main roles government or policymakers can play um, in order to be effective. Um, and there's three ways in which they can support the ecosystem. The first one is to act as a facilitator. This um, government can help by supporting um, to build the network. They can do this by implementing policies related to stakeholder networking, capacity building and educational programs. I could give you an example in the Pacific, the Pacific RISE program, which is funded by the Australian government. Um, they are operating in 14 Pacific Island countries. They started as a broker to build a network between social enterprises and investors. Um, and in its first six months of launching, the uh, Pacific Rise profiled 27 social enterprises and developed criteria to identify suitable intermediaries and investors that can support social enterprises. So I can provide another example in the Caribbean of the way the government can support the system um, through capacity building. Usually this can take the form of incubators or accelerators. Um, so social enterprises social entrepreneurs which can be led by um, they can be programs led by the government or run by intermediaries for instance in the caribbean we have the entrepreneurship program for innovation this is a seven-year program funded by the government of canada and implemented by InfoJ and the world bank this aims to support the high growth of sustainable enterprises across the caribbean by training and through funding networks the second um, important role, catholic, catholic role that government can play or policymakers can play is by supporting the ecosystem by making themselves customers of social enterprise um, goods and services. By becoming a market for the social enterprise, um, they can do this by providing capital and adopting social procurement policies. Um, I'll give you an example in South Africa. The Jobs Fund in South Africa was launched in June 2011 by the Minister of Finance, and this provided um, in excess of 1.2 billion US dollars. So this was a program to co-finance job creation and projects, um, job creation through projects in public, private, and non-governmental organisations. So with the use of public money to capitalise innovation. South Africa seeks to overcome pre-identified challenges to job creation. Um, and one final example of the government being a market, providing a market, is in Kenya, where there are several um, government funding opportunities to support enterprise, enterprises in relevant sectors, such as the Women Enterprise Fund, the Youth Enterprise Development Fund, and the UASI Fund for Women. And the last important role that we thought government could play is being that of a regulator. Um, I can provide an example in Ethiopia where um, during the COVID period, government gave tax um, relief to companies that were affected by the fallout of the pandemic. Um, in Nigeria, an example is when um, Afex, an inclusive business, 
described by the GIZ as um, a program which funded, um, which was launched by the Central Bank of Nigeria and the Ministry of Agriculture. This proved really critical um, when uh, cash had dried up in the economy. So these are just some, um, uh, a few emerging recommendations, but the panel discussions and questions um, discussed, uh, questions and answers will certainly bring out more. And hand over to Owen. Great, thank you so much, Sarah Jane, and to Bonnie as well. Um, really good snapshot and introduction to some of the key themes, which I think are um, pertinent here. And I think it's really interesting, sort of finishing on that slide about the, the potential role of of government um, and policymakers in terms of the market, in terms of facilitating the, the sector, in terms of building capacity, in terms of their regulatory role as well. And I think there's lots of ways that governments can play a role in terms of um, supporting, recognising, accommodating the great diversity of social enterprises that exist out there um, and not only supporting the kind of major successes that one might identify simply in terms of annual turnover and size and so on, because they're not always the, the great ones that are achieving the social impact. Um, and I think a, a kind of thriving social enterprise sector or, or landscape of inclusive businesses is really dependent on there being a whole variety of different organisations there, however they exist legally. Um, uh, and however they exist in terms of business model and so on. But um, we have a range of uh, panel speakers who are going to be able to speak much more um, well about these sorts of topics um, and with their ears close to the ground. Um, and so I will just give a brief introduction to them and you'll see their names up on the screen now. And in a second, I will ask them all to go into a little bit more detail in introducing what they do um, and, and their experience and their kind of initial views on, on these matters that we're hearing about. So. Um, just to speak briefly, we have Likumbi Kapiha, who uh, is a hub manager for Social Enterprise Academy in Zambia. We have Nguyen Kimani, who is an executive director for B-Lab East Africa. We have Katuchi Kasandi Wanjohi, who is a program manager for the Aspen Network um, of Development Entrepreneurs, which is abbreviated as Andy. And we have Ama Lati, who is co-founder of Social Enterprise Ghana and is also a director of, of Reach for Change. And all of those organizations are working with slightly different um, businesses and social enterprises. And uh, I'm sure they're all going to bring um, some great input and insight into this conversation. Now, just to hear a little bit more from you, I'm going to invite you all to just spend uh, four to five minutes each, just introducing yourselves a little bit more um, and any initial comments that you might have, especially um, uh, in terms of your organisation, the kind of enterprises that you work with, your geographical scope, and maybe also how models of social enterprise vary across the countries um, that you work. And also, if you have any examples um, in mind of good practice and policy that supports these sorts of organisations, uh, then please do also highlight those. So I will uh, first and foremost hand over to Likumbi Kapiha. Great to have you on board, Likumbi, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Owen. Thanks, uh, thanks for introducing me and uh, thanks for having me on this panel. Uh, it was really an insightful presentation that was given by uh, Bonnie and Sarah Jane. And some of those themes that came out of there uh, is actually what we see here in Zambia and across the Southern African region. But I'm the hub manager for the Social Enterprise Academy. It's a social franchise program, learning and development program that supports organizations and individuals who want to have a social impact through business. Uh, the academy itself is actually a social enterprise. And when you mentioned that idea of scaling horizontally, it started in, in um, Scotland and has scaled internationally using the social, inter social franchise model. So we, we always talk about the academy thinking globally, but acting locally because the program is then conte contextualized by each individual organization that uh, holds the franchise. Here in Zambia, uh, the academy franchise is held by an innovation and tech hub called Bongo Hive. Um, it's actually, Zambia's first innovation and tech hub has been around 10 years. Uh, using the traditional incubation accelerator models to support enterprises. And the academy program specifically supports social enterprises here in Zambia. Um, and so we take a bit of that flavor from, from Bongo Hive, um, I guess in, those, in the vein of Silicon Valley type of support for startups. But we also infuse um, 
some of the skills mindsets uh, that social entrepreneurs need to, to thrive. For example, we do run a program in measuring social impact on enterprise and leadership. And we found that um, our two key audiences we've been operating for the last two and a half years are young people uh, just coming to the job market who see social entrepreneurship as a career option, right? Uh, they, they are more in tune to the uh, values, uh, consumer values that want to have uh, social impacts. So even when they're making a purchase or starting a business, they care more about social uh, values in those uh, career choices. And the other uh, key client that we see is nonprofits who want to sh shift to a more sustainable model. I mean, you hear the things of donor fatigue and so on. And so some of these local community organizations are shifting to social enterprise models. So those are two distinct groups that we work with here um, uh, in, in Zambia, but we also work regionally. Uh, one of our partners is the British Council, and we also have are supporting the social and uh, creative enterprise, growth of creative enterprise sector in Zambia, Malawi, and Mozambique. Um, in terms of, I think I would stop at that point and allow my colleagues to introduce themselves before I go into good practice, if that's okay, on. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Nikambi, and we'll, we'll get more into some of that conversation shortly, I think. Uh, but really interesting, that actually, that you talked about the, um, the kind of journey towards becoming social enterprise, however that might be defined, and the fact that, yes, there's these roots from the kind of not-for-profit and NGO organisations uh, across, across Africa, the Caribbean and the Pacific um, that might want to sustain themselves uh, better financially. But then you also have these emerging entrepreneurs and there's great appetite isn't there I think among the young population to sort of address some of the social challenges that they see around them and I think that's a trend worldwide which is which is good to see but obviously need a little bit of support and then I guess there's also the kind of corporate businesses which have traditionally focused very much on profit but are increasingly having pressure put upon themselves to increase their social impact so maybe there's another journey there and obviously they're all going to have different needs as you allude to there um so thank you look and we will uh, return to you um but next i would like to uh introduce Nguyen kimani um executive director b lab east africa um and Nguyen, um it would be great to hear a little bit more from from your perspective thank you Thank you, Owen. Yeah, it's been a, an enlightening conversation so far, especially listening to um, the presentation from Bonnie and Sarah and what resonates. Um, so I am currently the executive director of B-Lab East Africa. Now, B-Lab is a global organization and what uh, B-Lab does is it's certifies and promotes and supports for-profit businesses um, that use their business as a force for good. And what we mean by that is that um, we are championing a movement where business owners and entrepreneurs look at their business as a way in which to have um, social impact and consider all stakeholders um, in, in the, the profits that they make. And uh, when we talk about stakeholders, we are referring to um, your customers and the people who work in your business, the community, as well as the environment in which you work. Um, and so we've been doing this in East Africa since um, 2017. Um, although we are a global network, um, because we want to be uh, mindful of the cultural differences and the economic differences that exist in different continents. We have hubs on each continent and we, although we in act separate, um, we try to grow the movement with one vision, which is, which is to have a regenerative economic system. Um, and here in East Africa, where we are based, we cover the entire East Africa region as well as the South Africa and Southern Africa region. Um, and we are looking forward to expand um, across the continent. Um, the work that we do, um, we really want to emphasize that all businesses, whether you are a social enterprise or not, um, you have the capability of having um, an impact beyond your shareholders. And so encouraging all businesses to think about um, 
their their strategy and how they can include all these stakeholders as they are working towards uh, their profit margins. Uh, we really have both, um, we call them commercial businesses and social enterprises who have certified as B corporations. And in Africa, a very um, intentional uh, mission is to accelerate a mind shift in the way business is done on the continent so that all businesses, even the ones who have been in, uh, in business for a long time, the large corporations begin to really think about the impact they are having on the communities that they operate in and on the environment, especially as they do business. So um, that's really the work that we do. So far, we have about 45 B corporations. Um, uh, these are companies that have certified. We also have over 700 businesses that use our B impact assessment tool. And our tools are free uh, to use by any business. So it would resonate more with your business if the business is a for-profit uh, entity. And so any business really can use our impact assessment tool to measure themselves across those five different areas. Um, again, that's your governance structures, your workers, the community, the customers, and the environment in which you operate. This year, we also launched the SDG Action Manager. It is a tool that we are encouraging all businesses to use to measure um, their baseline on the SDGs, how their businesses are contributing to attaining those goals by 2030. Um, it's also a free tool and it's, it provides guidance for attaining the, the SDG goals. Um, I, I think I'm going to follow Lekumbi's example and stop here before I get to how, how the, the varying um, setups influence financing needs. Also, I want to point out before I forget that the difference between um, our B corporations and um, and the regular businesses out there is that we encourage them to pick impact-driven business models. So um, what that means in an example form is that usually you would find a normal business saying, um, at the beginning of the year when I'm budgeting, I have a budget allocation for CSR um, for the community. Instead, we encourage the business to have CSR as part of the model. So for example, you might say you retail shoes. And so for every fifth, fifth sale, that sale goes back into the community or something like that. So that impact is embedded as a model in your business versus um, setting a budget aside for charity. So that's one of the main differences that you will find. Great, thank you so much, Engwing. That's all very interesting. And I wasn't aware of those five uh, sort of areas, and maybe we can go into that a little bit uh, more a little bit later as well. And I think it does highlight the kind of potential values that some sort of accreditation system can have for organisations. Um, and maybe that's uh, an example of something that investors um, and providers of finance might be looking for um, when they're developing their portfolio, some sort of third party accreditation. Um, I imagine that might be a factor. So that's really interesting. Um, interesting. And then Gwing, I think there's actually a request for a link to the SDG Action Manager. So if you're able to post okay. that for the audience, that would be really great. Um, but we will return okay. to you shortly, and Wing. Thank you very much for that. Um, and we'll see you. We'll see you soon. Um, so I am not sure if Katuchi is online at the moment. So for the moment, we're just going to. Um, Go straight to Amalati, who, as I mentioned, is a co-founder of Social Enterprise Ghana um, and is also director of Reach for Change, which is doing some great work in certain areas of Africa. So, Amma, great to have you on board. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Hi, Owen. Really great to be here. And um, Social Enterprise Ghana is a business association for the social enterprise sector. Um, it's an association that represents social enterprises, but we also have hubs, accelerators, and we have researchers, universities, all of whom are working together to create a vibrant ecosystem for social enterprise. 
Now, what this means practically is that we're organizing trainings for our members, for both the social enterprises and those who want to help them to build up their skills in a wide variety of things, including how to measure and communicate um, their impact. And one of the very first things that we did when we were founded in 2015 was to do a research on the Ghanaian definition of social enterprise. And the reason we did that was that there was a lot of questions about what a social enterprise actually was. And we approached that research um, from a qualitative point of view, going out to organizations that identified as social enterprises and trying to define social enterprise as, as, it, as it actually was. And what we found was that it was very similar to what has been shared before. We had for-profit companies that had been set up to pursue profits and a social impact. That had that social impact built into their business model. They were delivering a social good or a social service. And then we also had nonprofits that had set up a business either to fund their um, impact or because that business was an integral part of delivering that impact. So for example, if they were working with women living on the streets, they would fund a business that would employ these women. And then we had um, sort of people in between. And so we, we, we created this spectrum and um, a definition through the various focus groups to try and capture that. And I'll share that. Um, it's a social enterprise, it's an organization that applies business strategies to achieve social and environmental goals. And the focus of the organizations should be social impact first and profit second. And um, like I said, they were structured in very, very different legal forms and were pretty pragmatic when it came to legal form. And we took the approach of being inclusive in the definition. And I'm sure that the definition will continue to evolve as social enterprise, as the whole idea of using business as a tool for social good continues to evolve in Ghana and elsewhere. Um, we have 600 members currently um, working across all the various uh, um, parts of Ghana. And um, I look forward to sharing more details. I also am a director of Reach for Change in, in the Africa region. Reach for Change is a venture philanthropist. So at Reach for Change, we run incubators, accelerators, and hubs um, for social enterprises. And one of the things that um, always strikes me about our work is that 97% of the businesses that we've worked with are still in business. And it goes to, it, it sort of goes to support the the, the impact that can be achieved when you have an ecosystem around a business that is supportive, especially in emerging markets where other systems and um, other processes may, may pose challenges. Having that, that network or ecosystem can go a long way in enabling a business to be successful. I'll end here also and, and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much, Emma. Everyone's very disciplined in sticking to sticking to time. <laughs> I'm never ready, um, but no, that's all really great to hear, and it's um, really uh, reassuring to hear you kind of reinforce the point and the need for a supportive ecosystem, which I think we would probably all agree on. And I think certainly across the investment climate reform facility, across the various partners that are involved in delivering that, there's a there's a common understanding about the need for this ecosystem. And I think the point about this session is very much that that ecosystem needs to be able to accommodate uh, businesses that are working for social impact in, in their various forms. And I think you've all kind of alluded to it in different ways and kind of highlighted the respective strengths and priorities that you attach to, to profit first or to impact first or, or where things kind of sit on that line. And, and as you say as well, I think there's always going to be an evolving definition of things because the world out there isn't staying the same, is it? So um, I think it's the onus is on us as, as ecosystem supporters to kind of make sure that we adapt to to need. Um, so thank you, Amma. Um, now, I don't know if Katucci is uh, available and online. Let's just see if this works. Katucci, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, are you able to bring yourself up on camera? Um, I fear that she might not be able to at the moment. So perhaps we will wait to introduce Katucci into a little bit further down the line. Um, for the moment, perhaps we can um, just uh, present Hello, some... Hello, Owen? 
Hello, is that Katucci? Yes, this is Katucci. Great, Katucci. Please, um, great to have you on board. Uh, just as a reminder, you're program manager at Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing a bit more about what you do and, and your organization. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Owen, and um, uh, thank you both Sarah Jane and Bonnie for the uh, interesting introduction at the beginning. So as Owen has mentioned, my name is Katsuchi Kasandi, and I am a program manager with Andy in East Africa. So Andy is uh, a global network of member organizations and all the organizations uh, within the network do support entrepreneurship. And they do this by providing um, either critical financial, educational, or business support to a cluster of businesses called small and green businesses. And for purposes of this call, that's the cluster that I will be speaking a little bit more about. And as our members are supporting small and green businesses, they believe that these businesses are going to create jobs to stimulate long-term economic growth produce uh, environmental and social benefits and ultimately uh, help emerging markets be able to meet the economic uh, goals. So if I was to um, go and speak a little bit more about small and growing businesses, uh, at Andy we define small and growing businesses as commercially viable businesses with at least five to 250 employees that have a significant potential and ambition for growth. So uh, if you're to think about it in terms of uh, like the growth metrics, uh, these SGBs would typically uh, be looking for growth capital of uh, 20,000 uh, to $2 million. Uh, and if you're trying to think about them in uh, your traditional characterization of probably SMEs, you'd say that SGBs are uh, slightly um, larger than um, micro, micro, mm -hmm. micro, micro enterprises uh, in that they are not livelihood sustainable businesses that start small and, and remain small and at the same time they are smaller than medium-sized businesses and they often lack uh, access to the financial knowledge and resources that medium um, enterprises have access to so we like calling them the missing middle and all Andy's work is rallied towards strengthening the capacity of their members or through providing financial or capacity development support, uh, building ecosystems uh, where SGBs exist. And in all this, we are trying to propel uh, SGBs because we believe they are tools that can cause uh, sustainable development in emerging markets. If I was to talk about uh, like some of the um, differences that we see or some of the variations that we see across uh, in SGBs across different markets, uh, what I'd like to say that is about that is that as much as we give this range of oh, SGBs are looking for growth capital of in between $20,000 and $2 million, one of the things that we have seen is that number shifts depending on which market you are in. So, for example, um, recently we did some work in Uganda through our Uganda Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Initiative, and it was very evident to us that as much as we talk about that range, the small and green businesses in Uganda uh, were largely uh, in the lower tier of about 10,000 USDs. And um, to even, um, uh, and to even um, uh, uh, shed more light on that, in Uganda, we did not just work in the Kampala entrepreneurial ecosystem, we worked in an additional entrepreneurial ecosystem called the Gulu entrepreneurial ecosystem. And we saw significant uh, uh, differences among, in terms of like the growth ambition or the growth capital that is needed uh, 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 by small and growing businesses across uh, different uh, regions within the same look um, with, within the same country, and for us, uh, based off like for example, this Uganda Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Initiative, given that you have all these members that are seeking to support SGBs and they are coming with already this context, expecting them to fit into that profile that have defined, we went ahead and, um, and 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 shared a couple of recommendations, largely around you know like facilitating the establishment. Like we need to facilitate the establishment of new SGB funds that are investing between 20,000 to 300,000 uh, USDs because we realized that that was the what was that market was needing. Like that was the need. Those are the financing needs of the uh, of of that specific market. And over and above that, obviously there are other things around incentivizing and enabling commercial banks and microfinance institutions to scale up appropriate financial. Uh, uh, instruments for uh, SGBs in this tier. And I've had, a, 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 during the keynote speech, I had some of the things that some of the partners uh, of the initiative are doing around guaranteeing schemes or strengthening some of the credit 
uh, build your existing schemes in different countries and all this go a long way to ensure like some of those variations within SGBs are catered for across different markets. I will stop at that and pass it back to Owen and uh, I'll be happy to, um, to shed more light on this as we go on. So thank you, over to you Owen. Thank you so so much, Katuchi, and sorry we couldn't see you, but um, yeah, really great insights there. I mean, it's interesting also that you kind of um, highlighted some of the criteria by which you define uh, your kind of organisations, um, and obviously small and growing is, is kind of represented within the title, but like you say, five to 250 employees, and uh, interesting how each organisation and each of these networks kind of uses a different criteria uh, to provide the parameters for the for the businesses it supports. Um, so we will be opening up to um, kind of questions from the floor and from the audience um, shortly. Um, I guess there's just a couple of questions that come to mind um, for me, but please do note anything down um, that's come to mind based on what you've heard so far. And, um, and, and we'll make sure that we put those to, to the panel members. Um, I guess just um, an initial question for me, because this is about access to finance and we will down the line be focusing more on the kind of supply side of social finance and impact investment and what's going on within that uh, area. Um, but I think uh, given that we're focused on the demand side here in this range of organisations, it would be interesting from, from your perspectives to understand a little bit about um, what you see as kind of some of the most common factors that prevent or enable uh, the organisations and businesses you work with to access finance or what are kind of the, some of the most challenging criteria that investors place upon them um, and, and most common criteria that, that stop certain organisations getting the finance that they might need to deliver their impact. So I'm happy to take this from anyone but I mean um, Katuchi and Lukumbi maybe you're uh, well positioned to, to comment on that. I'd be, be great to hear from you um, and if when you reply it would be great to see your faces and, and have you on, on microphone again. Lakumbi, it was a while ago that we heard from you, please, if you've got any initial sure. response. I'll, I'll take it up I, and just frame it that I, I'm, we're really looking at early stage um, social enterprises, however you define them in your context, in, in, our, in our local environment. And I think one of the, there are two key barriers, I think. One is understanding um, what the finance, what investors are looking for. There is a definite gap in the capacity um, of the startups or the founders that we work with in understanding the financial terms, understanding how to put together a pitch deck, uh, even what understanding ESG metrics um, or, or that they're important, right? Um, if you start from the idea stage, even formalizing the social enterprise, and I think it was mentioned in one of the presentations that there's no legal criteria or regulation for social enterprises in many uh, of the African context or even ACP countries, and it's similar in Zambia. Um, so even having the legal form to take on uh, financial risk, uh, uh, there's not that um, framework set for, for founders. Um, so that's where learning and development or ecosystem players like ourselves come in to support them with that and to make the costs of doing that um, or the barriers to entry much lower. While many social enterprises um, you know, the whole term social enterprise should be profit making. The costs of formalizing, of getting that knowledge on board is just something they cannot bear at the early stage. So that's something we come in to uh, mitigate that and reduce those costs for, for social enterprise at the very early stage. But I'd be very interested to hear, uh, especially in other countries with, or other um, panelists who are working with more, with enterprises that are more along the, the growth stage, um, what those barriers might be so we can prepare them on, on our side. Yeah, that's great. And I'd be happy to hear from, from others. I guess one thing that you just mentioned there, which kind of takes us back to Bonnie's, um, was it one of Bonnie's slides, which was about the extent to which social enterprises at very early stages are sort of um, dependent on, on family, friends and own resources to fund what they're doing. Um, and it kind of highlights the need for, yes, the support organisations and the support that you, you're offering in your various um, uh, remits. Um, so does anybody else have a, have a comment on that investment side of things and, and how social enterprises vary in, in how they can meet that? Amma, you've come up on screen, so hopefully you've got something to say. Yes, yes Owen. Um, so where we sit, what we see is that um, social enterprises aren't very different from traditional startups if you look at our market. So at an early stage, you should be getting funding from family and friends. 
and having too much money too early unless you are an experienced entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, or someone who's coming to entrepreneurship with a lot of experience can actually result in a lot of waste that can kill you prematurely. And so that end of the market where you have family and friends is, you know, we all have family and friends, but once you go a step further than that, and you begin to require a bit of investment to put into assets or working capital to grow the business, that's when social enterprises begin to face challenges. Um, most, in most of the countries we, we work in at Reach for Change and also in Ghana, interest rates on loans are about 28% for regular bank loans. And debt capital is usually the most easily available capital. The market for patient capital is almost non-existent outside the family and friends. And so um, it's very difficult for a business that may be six months, one year old, and just having proven with you know, family and friend resources, a business model, needing to make a little bit more of an investment to be able to borrow at such rates. They won't even make the bank's eligibility criteria. They won't be able to show cash flows, et cetera. And so what we see is that there is a gap and it's huge. And so um, what we need to see is innovative financing products and tools that can deal with the risk at that, that size of markets. What Katuchi talked about, where you have below $20,000, um, but you have a little bit of history because the, 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 the company has been around for, for a while. And, um, and the needs are different. Um, incubation acceleration, those supports do help. Um, but the biggest issue is the lack of, of the financial products. Perfect. Thank you, Amra. And I do see we've got a question already in which I'll uh, address to you shortly because it's uh, from one of your colleagues in Ghana, I think. Um, but um, Nguing, and I see you've come up on screen and then we'll pass to Katuchi to also comment on this uh, point. Yes, um, I want to echo what Amra said about the difficulty in accessing um, loans with favourable rates because we face the same thing here. I want to add on to that um, about equity investment in terms of um, social enterprises and indeed our B Corps. One of the challenges that we see is that may, the investors may not be aligned with their purpose. So, so there might be investors who are not necessarily impact investors who are looking at the business as a way to maximize profit in the end. And so, so they may find um that the, that most of the investors want to get the most out of the business and they don't understand why um the businesses have chosen to to be mindful about those five areas that i mentioned earlier before um so so if there are decisions that are being made for example in how much you're paying your workers versus what um, similar businesses in the market is paying, if you're paying a bit more because you have that impact driven mentality, you might not be as attractive to an, inv an ordinary investor, right, than, than if you were <coughs> paying minimum wage in order to maximize profit at the end. So that's a challenge that we've seen. That's really interesting, Nguyen, and I think it kind of highlights that, that, that reference there at the end to the minimum wage is an interesting thing that came out in some recent research that we oversaw relating social enterprises to job creation and the fact that social enterprises are often creating a lot of jobs. Um, somebody's just, uh, Katuchi, is that you? Yes, uh, can you hear me on? Yes, please. Katuchi, go ahead. So this is uh, Katuchi, as you mentioned, when it comes to another challenge that we see, I know um, uh, all the panelists have highlighted a lot of challenges around um, uh, access to finance. Uh, maybe uh, um, Nguyen has touched a little bit about impact, but for us, a challenge that we've seen and we've developed a lot of um, uh, material and support to small and growing businesses to support this has been talent. And uh, when it comes to talent, we are thinking about what are some of the uh, skills that are available to help us small and growing businesses not only uh, build their businesses but actually get to the place where they can go ahead and scale and when i say talent i do not mean that they those skill sets are not available in the markets that we operate 
but unfortunately many at times those skill sets are available but they might be uh, at a price point where a small and growing businesses uh, business cannot uh, be able to afford and in instance where they can be able to source them and afford them sometimes they struggle and they compete with, with other like larger firms in terms of what are some of the things that you can offer to retain this uh, skill set within your uh, small and growing businesses so that you can be able to scale and remember when it comes to um, uh, to, to to looking at the risk profile of the uh, small and the gr and growing business an investor is interested to look at what is the complementarity of the skills, what are some of the mid-level management skills available, and if a small and growing business cannot attract and retain this, the right skill sets for those positions, it means then this, this becomes a barrier to even access to finance, and this becomes a, a barrier to growth within the business. So yeah, I will uh, leave it at that. Over to you, Cohen. Yeah, I think the talent aspect is, is really interesting because I think there's also the risk sometimes that it stays with the, the director or the founder and it's not necessarily passed through the organisation to the people whose time might be better spent kind of seeking out the finance and positioning for that. And so it's kind of how do you spread that talent across the right people within a small and growing business or a social enterprise or whatever so that everybody's kind of skills are, um, you know, uh, put to what their, their roles are. Um, I guess. We've had lots of questions coming in, so I, I really want to stay true to some of those. Um, so I'll kind of not just indulge in my own interests for the moment and, and kind of highlight some of the other things that have come through. So firstly, um, a question from, uh, I'm just trying to find it, uh, Edwin Zukujo, uh, who I've come across before. Welcome, Edwin. Um, and I'll just read out what his, um, his comment is, and maybe it's um, interesting for AMA, but others might want to comment as well. What are some of the successful examples of fund of funds established that have supported early stage social enterprises that need small patient capital of, for example, $2,000 to $10,000? Um, it would be really interesting to hear some examples that maybe um, others can, can learn from and try and replicate in other countries and to uh, reflect a little bit on how well they worked and that will certainly be a topic of further conversations down the line but for the moment does anyone have any um good examples they'd like to refer to i'm happy taking answers or my experience a deathly silence amma great to have you back hi owen um i i don't have a an example for that size of of sort of deal but we have examples in Ghana, we have a fund of funds called the Venture Capital Trust Fund that then seeds um, um, new funds. It's, it's, I guess you can think of it as an impact fund of funds because its goal is to catalyze the impact investing, sorry, the, the venture capital um, sort of ecosystem. However, we think that there is a need for an impact fund of funds and um, a private sector led impact fund of funds not just a government-led fund of funds and that the the depth of of um of the, the 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 lack of resources is so acute that there needs to be multiple initiatives and there are some examples from the uk like big society capital that um, was set up as a fund of funds and that is one way that governments can begin to look at how to catalyze ecosystems by setting up mechanisms that don't necessarily create a parallel entity, but create an entity that is able to stimulate growth in a particular sector and, and unlock capital in a way that is sustainable. Perfect, thank you. And yes, Big Society Capital is a good example there. It's faced challenges of its own. Um, so I think there's learning to be taken from that and not the assumption that it's the kind of idealistic form. Um, and I'm sure they would be the first to admit that there's um things that they uh, could be implemented differently in different countries, but certainly a good example to, to check out. Um, does anyone else have a comment on that? Or I'm happy to move to the next question because we have got a few. Um, let me just pause for three seconds in case you uh, want any, um, uh, any space to, to highlight some examples there. Okay, we'll leave that then for the moment, but a, a great question and it kind of highlights that there need to be more examples of those sorts of fund of funds that really kind of meet this missing uh, space uh, um, in provision in terms of funding and investment. Now this is an interesting question and it's from uh, Joni Simpson. You mentioned some of the characteristics of the entrepreneurs. I have heard anecdotal evidence that women make up a larger share of social entrepreneurs. 
I wonder if this is true in your country contexts. Are you able to collaborate with any of the ongoing women's entrepreneurship development programs in your country? And as I think one of Bonnie's slides highlighted, there is a, a high number of, um, of female entrepreneurs around the world. And in some contexts, they face specific challenges in terms of access to support and finance. So are there any reflections on, on, the, um, uh, on the female entrepreneur side of things from any of our panel speakers? Can I jump in at this point? Please. Sure. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, we do run several entrepreneurship support programs here at the, the Social Enterprise Academy and also through Bongo Hive. Anecdotally, even if we do not uh, tag a program as women or focus on women, we get between 40 to 60 percent uh, participants being women. Uh, where the ch and some of the most successful uh, uh, businesses that have come through our programs are from women founders. Where we see the difference is who accesses the funding. Is it the women-led uh, startups or the male-led ones? And the male-led ones still uh, tend to lead. And maybe this could be for several different reasons. Um, it could also be, for example, cultural norms, uh, time, so many different different factors and it's not one of the things we're unpacking. But what is exciting in our market in Zambia and also in the Southern African region is more small scale uh, private funders, uh, venture funds that are just focused on women. In fact, just the other month, one called WCAP launched in Zambia, for, uh, founded by women founders themselves. There's only a small handful of them and they got together and said, hey, we've actually gone through some of these um, challenges of getting access to funding. We want to solve that problem for um, women-led uh, startups. Another great one to look up is Enigma Ventures. It's about a year old out of South Africa. And that's great because they're funding um, impact, impact funding all across the sub-Saharan region. So for my colleagues in other countries, you know, from Ghana, Kenya, you may want to consider looking at Enigma Investments. And they specifically look at women-led and operated um, impact investing. Great, thank you, Lukambi. It'd be great if you could share a link to that that we can then share with the, with the audience. Um, now, uh, Katuchi, I think you were going to come in. Uh, yes, uh, Owen, can you hear me? Certainly can. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, with regard to women, again, I can't uh, give you like exact uh, uh, statistics in terms of the, the number of women that are looking for opportunities, uh, for example, in East Africa. But one of the things that we have seen in our data through our Global Accelerator Learning Initiative is that you will see, okay, and, 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 and a bit of background. So our Global Accelerator Learning uh, Initiative is a longitudinal study that seeks to understand the efficacy of the acceleration model and what we have done that is over the years since 2013 we've been partnering with accelerator programs and the businesses that make into an accelerator program and those ones that are rejected and collecting data across different metrics to see if by participating in the accelerator programs the businesses that were accepted are able to perform better in terms of uh, 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 capital growth invest I mean, revenue growth, investment growth, and job creation. And then we compare those uh, results with those ones that were rejected to see if the acceleration as a model works. So in, in the course of collecting that data since 2013, you will see that in a lot of our Gali data, uh, there are in, um, women uh, will have, will generate women-led businesses or women focused businesses will generate more revenues uh, uh, than the male ones. But when it comes to investment, uh, investors will still prefer male led businesses. So for us, one of the things that has been interesting is that you would think that an investor uh, in some of the data, and this is not the entire data, this is a specific knowledge brief that we released. It, it, it is your expectation that an investor would be interested in a business that has more revenues. But unfortunately, you find that the women-led one will have more revenues, but the one that is a male one would be selected over this. And that has intrigued us to develop a whole programming around women. And in 2020, 2019, Andy launched, we launched our new strategic plan. And one of our priority areas uh, is um, uh, gender equality. And around that, we are working on ecosystem development work. And uh, in this specific work, we are partnering with USAID and uh, Visa Foundation. And we, we are launching a program called Action Labs. And with the Action Labs, what we want to do is that we want to bring women entrepreneurs, women, um, uh, 
sorry, entrepreneurs that are focusing on women, either women as consumers, women as leaders, or women as employees, uh, and other intermediaries across the ecosystem to identify what are some of those persisting uh, gaps that are 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 perpetrating some of the gender inequalities in the entrepreneurship space, and I and and identifying what's one, what what is that systemic solution that we could all rally our 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 sort of like efforts around so that all of us if we are able to if you are able to rally our efforts around this and uh, hopefully get a solution or move the um, uh, move the tide then all of us can be able to support women entrepreneurs or women consumers or women uh, leaders better so yeah so we will be doing this the whole of uh, 20 the whole of 2021 so from january to december 2021 we will work on prototyping solutions at an ecosystem level and then at the end of the year the hope is that we'll have identified a solution a systematic level solution that we can then go ahead and fund and scale it we are doing this in east africa we are doing this in west africa we are doing this in south africa for african countries but we're also doing this in um uh, in latin america and asia and i'm um, Andy has developed a lot of resources around gender because this is an area of focus. So I'm happy to share further resources in terms of uh, like some of the inequalities or some of the data that we've uncovered around like uh, issues that women entrepreneurs face and some of the recommendations through literature that have been proposed in terms of some of the things that we can do to address some of those inequalities. That's great. Thank you so much, Katuchi. And really interesting. The um, Global Accelerator Learning Initiative is, is a great one um, that I've had um, uh, looked at. And I encourage everybody to sort of visit that site and also keep uh, keep an eye on what Katuchi was talking about there for 2021. And it would be great if people, when they're referring to these things, can um, provide links that we can share with the audience. That'd be great. Amma, you'd like to say something? Yes, Owen. Um, just a, a minute to add to what Katuchi was saying. And when it comes to issues of inequality and bias, one of the most effective things that we've seen is to diversify your decision makers. So if you're on the line and you're an investor making investment decisions and everybody on your decision panel looks the same, comes from the same background, you have bias, whether or not, it, it's not intentional, it's just a, a fact of life because you're all very similar. And so um, having more women in those decision seats is important. And whilst you may not be able to change the, the, the whole sort of um, staffing of your company, you can invite external people to be part of those decision panels so that that bias is minimized. You can, in developing programs for specific parts of the country, I see a question around um, village level, rural, urban divide, um, you need to visit those places and include people who are knowledgeable about how business works in this context in your decision making or else you miss out on opportunities that you just don't get. And that is one of the key reasons why even though a, a woman led business may have stronger revenues, stronger performance, it's still evaluated negatively because of the unconscious bias that is at work. And so um, we should drive more diversity um, especially when the funders are not coming from the local context in which they seek to fund in. That's great, thank you. And I know gender is the, the, the common kind of inequality to, to refer to because obviously it's an important one that's sort of systematic across uh, most of the world. Um, but there's other areas of inequality and it's interesting that you referred to those there. And just to refer to the question that you mentioned there, I'll just read it in full to see if anybody else has a, a response on that. It's a question from Naomi, Mwasambili, hopefully I've pronounced your name okay. Um, and her question is, how are you working to not exacerbate inequalities in investment and funding? As we know, the concept of social enterprise is ambiguous and most investment actually goes to expats and people from upper classes in many African countries. Are any organizations working at a village level? Um, so you've sort of referred there to some of those aspects, Amar. I wonder if there's any other comments from, from the panel members on those themes. Possibly not. So I think I think what Amar referred to there is really important in terms of having the diversity and the range of experience and, and background on and built into the kind of investment infrastructure. And I think that's certainly something that maybe 
will be explored by Bonnie and Sarah Jane within the current policy paper that they're working on, uh, but certainly future um, policy papers once we start moving on to the supply side. Maybe, Amma, you've got something to, to add here. I do, I do. And um, one of the, the things that all organizations, and I know we have a varied audience, need to look at is what your strategy is for going national if you have a national focus. Um, Social Enterprise Ghana began very much as a city-based initiative and we quickly realized that most of Ghana is not in the cities and began to organically grow supporting rural areas. And the way we've been able to do that is to work through our businesses who have rural entrepreneurs in their supply chain um, because there were many barriers, education, etc. But there was that connection. And so through working through these businesses, we've been able to run programs that reach businesses in the informal sector in a way that is sustainable because these programs are run through their key purchaser or someone who has a, a strong and enduring business relationship with them. And we need to see more innovation in social enterprise and more local based ecosystem in innovation. Whilst players like Andy are really important and the work they do is impactful. And um, if there are people in the audience who have ideas or thoughts or initiatives that are local led and um, those need to begin to be amplified and to be able to connect with networks like Andy and um, to be able to access resources and that's how we'll begin to see some of the, the inequality issues being dealt with. Okay, great. I'm uh, loving the fact that this is, uh, this is stimulating such great discussion. We've got various panel members wanting to respond now. Multiple questions in, so I'm sorry if we don't get to your question, but we'll ensure that we take them down and ensure that they're covered uh, either in the policy paper or future webinars. Um, so thank you for engaging so greatly in this. Um, Katuki, I think you've got a comment. Yes, uh, so just following up to what Ami has said, I will say that um, in our experience, in the past we have so one of the things that you when you read a lot of literature about east africa you will see that a lot of the city in a lot of, in a lot of the east african countries let me talk about kenya and uganda because we've done research around this in those markets entrepreneurship is very um, uh, capital city centric and therefore uh, one time in partnership with global affairs canada we set up a technical facility uh, fund so it was uh, it was um, a, a global affairs technical uh, uh, a technical assistant facility that was being managed uh, by Andy. And one of the criteria for actually an investor tapping into this TA facility, it was a matching fund, was for them to invest in pipeline that was outside of Nairobi. And there are very specific areas and very specific sectors that we want that that we, we selected and a lot of some of the investors that were even interested in tapping into this funding their biggest struggle was accessing a pipeline in some of those secondary cities i'm not justifying that but now in our work that we've further gone and do in uh, and done in uganda we've realized that when it comes to sometimes even like some of the barriers that uh, have made investors for example not going to some of the secondary cities to support some of the uh of the small and green businesses that are there is there is sort of like a non-existent uh ecosystem to support like the small and green businesses that they are looking uh, for so for example you will realize that a lot of the accelerators a lot of the incubators a lot of networks have just focused their uh their areas of operation into the secondary city and a lot of the small and green businesses that have went that are based outside of this uh, capital city, if they need to seek this support, they have to come and, and, and set up a base in the city. So that perpetrates this inequality where then entrepreneurship or like this growth oriented or in, uh, entrepreneurship becomes very uh, um, capital city centric. So in Uganda, uh, we've started doing some catalytic work in secondary regions. So for example, with the entrepreneur ecosystem initiative work that we are doing in Uganda, we are not only focused on the Kampala entrepreneurial ecosystem, but we've since gone ahead and started doing some work in the Gulu entrepreneurial ecosystem. And just at the onset, what we started by doing was to just do an, a diagnostic assessment of Gulu to understand what are the existing resources for the entrepreneurs and what are some of the challenges that entrepreneurs face there. And as I'd mentioned earlier, 
even within the same geographic or with the same country, like the needs were very different. And uh, we realized that for us to actually even be able to uh, sort of like unlock financing in like a, a secondary city in um, Uganda, there was a lot of need for us to start doing catalytic work that would then incentivize investors, will incentivize uh, the, 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 the sort of like other existing support system around entrepreneurs for it to be attractive enough for the investors. But again, all this, we are talking about external investors coming in. I know there still exist a lot of opportunities for us starting to nurture, like whether those are like government funding opportunities or whether uh, there are uh, like local investor opportunities among some of those secondary cities. But in all that, there has to be like a support system that is catalyzed to exist for there to be interest enough. So as Andy, we started doing this in Agulu and we have since we have started seeing there are, for example, Innovation Village in Uganda now has a now has a hub in Gulu. We are starting to see like a bit of work coming into that market. And we know with time, we'll start seeing investors being interested in that region. And hopefully as we are doing this and we are learning, we can be able to replicate this across other markets where we are working in. Because if there is no, no existing ecosystem support there, it becomes, it's sort of like, it, it becomes very hard to incentivize a commercial investor to expand into a market like that. It becomes an area that is then just left to probably like nonprofits and uh, uh, financial institutions like uh, banks and some of those uh, entrepreneurs are not at the level or they do not have the risk profile. They do not have the kind of documentation that is needed for you to be attractive to a bank. I'll stop at that and hand it over to uh, Owen. Thank you, Katuchi. That's great. Um, yeah, and I'm sure some of those uh, reports and that research that you've done, which highlights the differing needs, will be really interesting for the report and um, to feed to Bonnie as well, Bonnie and Sarah Jane. Um, as I said, we've got lots of questions, so thank you for engaging in this. I think, uh, Likumbi, um, you wanted to speak maybe about partnering to reach rural and vulnerable groups. It'd be great to have a quick comment on that, and then I'll try sure. and um, introduce another question. Sure, I'll be really quick. I, I was just going to share on our, our own strategy here at Bongo Evans Ocean Enterprise Academy, how we reach those vulnerable groups is really through partnerships uh, as opposed to creating our own footprint in some of these communities. So as I think um, Tatuchi mentioned that entrepreneurship is very uh, capital city centric, but even within the capital city, there's that very interesting peri-urban area split and uh, you know, urban poverty. Uh, or whether you've seen through the shanty towns or whatever it is in other other countries, and one way our entrepreneurship programs or entrepreneurship support reaches those communities is partnering with existing organisations that work in those communities. So one good example for us that hits two important target groups: women and people, micro people um, in peri-urban areas. We've partnered with uh, an organisation called uh, We Create, or WEAC, and we together uh, work on programs that are targeted just for women who are starting those, you know, those businesses in, in those communities. In terms of reaching the rural areas, again, uh, it's very difficult for us to say our scale, our strategy to scale is to have um, hubs in all corners of, of Zambia, specifically for Zambia, we're very sparsely populated. There's, you can go hundreds of kilometers before the next uh, settle, settlement of people. So what we've done, and actually we led this program all of last year, was to improve um, sort so of the value, agricultural value chain. We partnered with an organization uh, called Masika that was specifically working on making markets work for uh, rural farmers and did sort of entrepreneurship training there. So we didn't have to um, create a hub in those places, but over a 10 month period, we were there I think twice a month and it wasn't just flying in because we were with, with the existing partner that they knew and our strategy has been to create the partnerships that help us uh, target those vulnerable groups or those rural areas and even we, uh, work regionally. It's all about creating the partnerships and having and finding the right partners that share the same values and objectives that you have and I think that's the trick in, in there. Thank you. Kumbi, you've just provided a model answer for segueing into a question which I'd really like to pose to the panel, which has come from Abby Taylor, and it kind of um, uh, responds to some of the issues which some of you highlighted earlier. Um, so Abby says, I work for a large international funder of innovation. Organisations like mine have huge resources at our disposal, but it's hard to get those resources to the right places. 
are there any international organizations you would point to as best practice in working to overcome the challenges that organizations like my own create thinking of challenges such as funding western educated entrepreneurs all the time or organizations with international connections etc so there's a real kind of appetite and desire to to better kind of work with uh, local organizations rather than going to the same kind of uh, crowd which might be well connected might be well uh, rehearsed in pitching um, and rehearsed in submitting the sort of information that investors like to see so we've just got five minutes or so for any responses but i think that's a good question to end on and as i said it'd be um we will try and address some of the other questions through other formats um following this uh, webinar uh, amma yes great to hear from you Yes, I'll, I'll be very brief. I would say work with the existing ecosystem, take time to understand who's in the ecosystem. An organization that's done that well, there's a British Council project, um, GID funded, that was run last year in Ghana. It worked through seven existing incubation hubs. Many of them were in secondary cities and were hubs that were earlier stage, but it means that the design of the program needs to include building the capacity of your implementing partners. So that can be an effective way. And um, at, at Reach for Change, we've done the same thing in, in focusing on local entrepreneurs. And so look for organizations that are focused on local entrepreneurs and also design the help for the ecosystem into your intervention. Perfect, thank you. And Wing, I wonder if you have a, a comment on that. Um, being part of B-Lab, which is obviously an international organization, there must be ways that you try and connect with and support through um, embedding within local ecosystems. You know, you, I, I was just about to say that B Lab is one such organization that you can reach out to to help you because what we do is we work a lot with partners. So if we work with um, social enterprise groups, women's groups, uh, even Kepsa, which is which is also um, um, the private sector uh, um, association. Um, so I think that like what Amma said is if you're trying to to find um, the right businesses to work with in the rural areas, um, you just need to plug into one to to one um, to one organization or entity that is working with businesses and has partners, and then we will be able to direct you to the right place that you want to go. Yeah, I mean, I would add, I think all of the organizations that are represented on the panel today are good examples and good connectors to, to work through and to get contacts that are embedded within local ecosystems. Um, Likumbi, you just came up on camera. Did you want to add anything? Or was that a mistake? Yes, just, just a quick one about, for the international, uh, international organizations. I think one thing uh, Ama did mention is like, know the lay of the land and who's, know who's in the ecosystem and know what their role is, but also understand the, any capacity constraints of those potential partners. Uh, speaking for our organization, we're quite tiny and many people wear several hats. So sometimes when big funders come in and expect certain things from us, uh, it can be quite stressful to, to deliver those things or reporting requirements or whatever the administrative needs are. It would be great if they come in and build capacity, but also understand that they're stretching uh, some of these organizations quite far to meet their uh, standards. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. And Katucci, I think you wanted to say something brief. Uh, yes, so the one thing that I'll also uh, mention is that uh, for some of those funds, if you can, uh, so over and speaking to uh, like other organizations that are based in the ecosystem, consider embedding yourself into the ecosystem by having a staff, local staff, even if it's one that is based in that specific market where you are interested in. Perfect, thank you. Maybe one final question to just... And... Um, oh, okay. One of the things that I've seen with one of our funders, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry for interrupting. Uh, oh, sorry, just... I was saying one of the things that I've seen also with some of the funders that are coming in market uh, is um, it, as, as, as a funder who has resources, if at the onset you could actually consider like seeding so many um, 
local organization and starting to uh, see those that thrive and then scaling those models. So for example, with Andy, one of the things that we've done with a funder in the past is like really if they are interested in a specific uh, area, like running a challenge fund with them and them looking for different innovative ways, I mean looking for different models that they would want to support and then sending an external, the funder sends an external evaluator to look at which local models have worked and then they look at that model and have scaled up. And their funder in the global funders that have financing that have done a lot of work to support uh, uh, local organizations and I, 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 I'm happy to connect you to our Gideas Foundation for you to see all the local all the local business development support programs even some of them you do not know how they exist they are supporting in East Africa and I like when you hear the executive director saying that they usually see a lot of local businesses and they track their impact very carefully and eventually they, they will start looking at which ones are having the impact they are looking for and those are the models they will scale. So take that risk, spread uh, what are many seedlings and then see the ones that sprout locally and then support those ones. But just take that risk and put money into it. Uh, it most of the people want perfect organizations that are already existing that they're already doing good but if you want to create impact uh take time and do uh, and take and use such models so over to you owen great thank you katushi that's really great um i would highlight that uh, a lot of the questions kind of relate and, and, and some of the things you've spoken about which is really um useful is the kind of finance and social finance side of things and the way that investors are working or not working well to deliver the money that's needed to different organizations wherever they might be whoever they might be led by what sort of business types they come in we'll certainly be going more down the line um, in future uh, sessions in this series to look at the kind of social finance and impact investment infrastructure and uh, conventional practice to see how well that is kind of being flexible and tailored to the needs of social enterprises and really focus more on, on that side of things. So do keep an eye out for that, that next session. Uh, and I think we're, we're not going to have time to address it here, but one question which kind of um, struck me and I think it's something that we're going to need to keep in mind from this demand side of social enterprises and businesses. One person asked, oh, who knows, Celestia, how many years of bootstrapping must a, a social enterprise survive in order to prove that they can carry risk or be attractive to investors? And I think that's such a pertinent point, really. Um, what, do, what, you know, it's the kind of chicken and egg sort of situation, like how much can you really do um, and how long, how many years, how many months do you have to sort of put yourself and your family through additional burden to kind of really prove that you've got a viable social impact model um, that's really going to show investors what they need to see from their perspective. So these are all discussion points and themes which we would um, like to return to um, at some point. But I think uh, we'll have to close the Q&A for, for, for now. Thank you for engaging so much with that. I've we had um, uh, Christian uh, Lung uh, from uh, the OACPS, which is the organization of uh, African, Caribbean and Pacific states. Um, she was going to give an initial address, but um, wasn't available. I think she's here now. She's an expert in charge of the infrastructures and economic services of the Secretariat of the OACPS. So, Christiana, it'd be great to hear from hear from you. Yeah. Hello. Do you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Thank you, Christian. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for uh, giving me the floor, and uh, I'd like to apologize uh, because I had some uh, technical uh, problem. Uh, uh, to connect. Yeah, first of all, mm, I'd like to apologize for the absence of the Assistant Secretary uh, General, Monsieur Olivier, uh, Ecipion Oliviera. Uh, we supposed to, to give the opening remark, but he, uh, he has been um, retained for some other uh, engagement. So the Secretariat uh, value uh, too much this cooperation with um, with uh, ICR uh, for the implementation of uh, this uh, program uh, uh, with the uh, with the consortium member. I think during the last uh, three days uh, we have followed a series of uh, uh, training uh, workshop, and uh, I hope that uh, those training have helped a lot the beneficiary. Uh, to strengthen their capacity building with regard to these uh, uh, various uh, financial uh, instruments. 
Um, as for uh, uh, today, as for today, um, with regard to uh, the needs of social uh, enterprises and uh, inclusive uh, business, I think uh, the session uh, give uh, the training session uh, give an opportunity uh, for sharing of uh, uh, experience uh, between uh, the region, the ACP region, from one country to another country, uh, uh, Ghana, uh, uh, Uganda, Kenya. Um, and then um, allow to to share uh, common challenges uh, for these um, for these uh, social enterprises uh, to access uh, uh, funding. So I think the lesson learned from this uh, workshop will will help uh, each other uh, 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 with uh, access uh, to finance. Uh, how to how to do it, how the other one have done that. So I think th this is most uh, uh, valued. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, all the presenters, all the participants to the training workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much for being able to, to join, Christiane, and it's really great to hear from the, um, the OACPS as well. Um, I think, yeah, I'd just like to echo the, the massive thank you to our panel members. That was a really, really good, rich discussion with uh, viewpoints and perspectives from um, all sorts of regions, from your various work. I think it kind of highlighted some of the subtle nuanced differences between uh, the different organizations and uh, business types that you work with, but also highlighted some of the common challenges uh, in terms of accessing support, whether that be financial or otherwise. I think a key, uh, aspect of this investment climate reform facility is also to place policymakers uh, in the limelight um, to see how they can work better with a uh, private sector to address some of the issues that we've spoken about today, uh, to recognise mm -hmm. and validate and to support the diversity of social mm -hmm. enterprises that exist across mm -hmm. ACP countries. Um, mm. And I think it's really uh, the beginnings of a great series which is going to be exploring both the demand side and the supply side. I would echo that um, there's going to be a policy, make, uh, policy paper soon that explores some of these issues from the demand side. There will also be uh, future webinars uh, exploring more and going in greater depth on the demand side and supply side around fin social finance and impact investment. Um, so please do keep an eye open for that. Now, one thing that I'd like to just uh, highlight before, before closing um, is that as part of the Investment Climate Reform Facility, we uh, do offer uh, virtual one-on-one -on -one clinics, which provide um, tailored support uh, to uh, questions and queries and challenges that certain or organizations might be facing in this area. So as you should be able to see on screen, these are targeted support, virtual individual support sessions. Eligibility, uh, these are primarily for public or private stakeholders that are based in African, Caribbean and Pacific countries. Uh, slots will be granted based on availability um, and uh, the organization's um, uh, suitability to this facility. Um, and we will also try and respect a regional balance across the African, Caribbean and Pacific regions. Um, these sessions are also available in French if that's needed. Um, and please, if you are interested in that, uh, do register your interest um, by the 22nd of October. There's an email address there which you can uh, send your request to, which is icrfacility at giz.de. Um, and please indicate your organisation and the questions that you want to ask in that email. Um, it'd be great if they don't come from single organisations, but a kind of a collaborative request between organisations representing uh, the sector in different countries um, across the ACP region. Thank you.